everyone. My name is Saad Kuba from uh, University of Arizona, Banner, Tucson. I have the uh, very nice task of introducing uh, everyone. Uh, first, we'll start off by uh, introducing Dr. Uh, Brent uh, Goodman. Dr. Brent Goodman is a board certified in uh, neuromuscular medicine and neurology. Uh, he previously served as the uh, practice chair, chair of neuromuscular neurology and director of the autonomic laboratories an autonomic program at Mayo Clinic. As an autonomic and neuromuscular neurology specialist, Dr. Goodman's clinical and research efforts are focused on uh, neurobiology, autonomic disorders, and neuromuscular disorders. He's one of the country's top experts and has lectured nationally and internationally on various uh, neuromuscular disorders, neurophysiology, autoimmune neurology, Sjogren's disease, and disorders of uh, autonomic nervous system and he has won multiple awards for his research in patient care and research. Well, it's a privilege to be here, um, and thanks for inviting a neurologist uh, to what, amongst a bunch of cardiologists, so thanks. It's good to be here. I'm gonna start with a case and end with a case. Um, title of this one is Time is Nerve, which I think we need to remember, right? We're in an awesome age of therapeutics, and uh, um, I would advocate for starting them early and not letting patients develop like this one did. This was a 72-year-old man. I saw him a while ago, I think at least 14 years ago. He had, he had been diagnosed with uh, CIDP, had a history of weakness and sensory loss, and for those unfamiliar with the term CIDP, it's chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyradicular neuropathy. It's a acquired, immune-mediated, demyelinating condition of nerves, so it's a chronic form of Guillain-Barre syndrome, if you're familiar with that. So initially presented with burning pains in his hands and his feet, he developed symptoms which ascended upwards, affected his arms, he developed marked gait unsteadiness and postural lightheadedness without syncope. I'm going to say it multiple times, patients with CIDP do not develop orthostatic hypotension, red flag. So he had multiple evaluations prior to ours, no, a number of biopsies and be, had been diagnosed with, uh, with CIDP at a sural nerve biopsy which was reviewed at this large university um, in an adjacent state. No, there was no Congo red staining including review uh, at our, in our neuropathology lab. He was put on IVIG, put on rituximab, symptoms continued to worsen. Maybe a family history of something, maybe MS, maybe something else. Um, he had orthostatic hypotension on examination. Patients with CIDP do not develop orthostatic hypotension. Um, normal cranial nerves, he was weak in both upper and lower limbs, both distally and proximally, so horribly affected. He was actually in a wheelchair when he came. His reflexes were absent. Um, sensory examination, he had horrible uh, sensory impairment, so he had a severe sensory ataxia. What that means is you lose your, your proprioception, and uh, you, so you have difficulty even standing. Even this gentleman, even when sitting on the bench, if he closed his eyes, he had a hard time staying seated upright. So horrible uh, sensory ataxia. His laboratory studies were unremarkable. Um, here's his EMG. The zeros are really bad. Um, so he has zeros everywhere, so no responses in his peripheral nerves. Doesn't look like CIDP. Here's his autonomic testing at horrible orthostatic hypotension, dropped systolic 80 points. Patients with CIDP do not develop orthostatic hypotension. Um, this is his autonomic testing, which, which uh, up top, the top tracing, um, shows a drop in blood pressure without any increase in heart rate, heart rates in green. Um, and so severe orthostatic hypotension. And he had a fat aspirate, which was unremarkable. Uh, we reviewed his outside sural nerve biopsy. I did a second one. I wouldn't do a second sural nerve biopsy today, but this was 14 years ago or so. And uh, I ordered an echo. I was suspicious of amyloid when I saw him. And the echo was suspicious. And um, we did an endomyocardial biopsy. He had amyloid on biopsy of the heart. He had, uh, we then did gene testing. These days I would have done gene testing right after seeing him in the clinic. I wouldn't have ordered a sural nerve biopsy. Um, and he, his genetic testing showed uh, transthyretin. Interestingly, he came from a, 
a little area in Italy. At the time, this mutation had been reported in only one family in this, in a nearby area in this, this little spot in Italy. And so probably those family members that had supposedly been diagnosed with MS probably had amyloid. So take home points on this case. Uh, tissue can be misleading, particularly sural nerve biopsy if it's negative. It's often negative in transthyretin amyloid, so remember that. Neuropathy plus orthostatic hypotension is amyloid until proven otherwise. Neuropathy plus orthostatic hypotension is amyloid until proven otherwise. CIDP, I think I've mentioned this a few times, CIDP does not cause <laughs> orthostatic hypotension. If you read articles, it's, they suggest that CIDP can be confused with, with amyloid. It really shouldn't. Autonomic dysfunction, that's significant doesn't happen in CIDP. So general considerations uh, with, uh, with respect to the nervous system. Nervous system involvement, it, it may be the first system to be involved. Obviously, we've talked a lot about the heart and we'll continue to do so, but remember that, uh, that neurologically, the peripheral nerves may be involved first, or most patients, almost every patient I've ever seen with amyloid has a history of carpal tunnel. Usually, the carpal tunnel is bilateral. It's usually symmetric. Importantly, once uh, there is significant neurological impairment, it's at least currently, even with the silencers, irreversible. So I would advocate strongly for early treatment in these patients. Many of the patients, if we don't catch them in time, they require symptomatic uh, treatment. And I think a question for us is whether um, particular mutations will look a certain way phenotypically. Will they involve the autonomic nervous system? Will they involve the somatic peripheral nervous system, et cetera? I don't think we know that at this point. Um, so what are the potential <laughs> neurological manifestations? I personally consider carpal tunnel syndrome and neurological manifestation, but I also do EMG for a living. Um, lumbar spinal stenosis, we see that in many or most patients. Um, we, of course, see peripheral neuropathy and then autonomic neuropathy. So what are our tools? Of course, the history and the examination, nerve conduction studies, needle EMG, autonomic testing. We do autonomic testing on all our patients suspected of having uh, peripheral nerve or autonomic uh, symptoms. One can consider doing epidermal nerve punch biopsy, looking for small fiber neuropathy. You can also do Congo red staining on epidermal skin punch biopsy, of course, lumbar MRI and genetic testing. I would advocate for genetic testing very early on. If I have, if I have an individual with a peripheral neuropathy and any significant amount of autonomic dysfunction, I almost always uh, do genetic testing for uh, transthyretin. So in, in neurology, we of course see uh, a number of different types of, of amyloid. Um, probably the most common type that, that I'm seeing at this point is wild type, um, which can be associated with a mild, very, very, very mild peripheral neuropathy, some autonomic dysfunction, but usually the autonomic dysfunction is subclinical in wild type amyloid, meaning we can see abnormalities on testing, but patients don't typically have, um, have symptoms. So AL amyloid with respect to the uh, nervous system can look different than familial amyloid um, and of course have other, it's more likely to have other systems involved. Uh, with transthyretin amyloid, again, we're looking for peripheral neuropathy, looking for autonomic dysfunction, and then you almost always hear that history of carpal tunnel, which often predates the history of significant um, autonomic dysfunction. With wild type amyloid, all of these patients have spine disease, and it's not just lumbar spinal stenosis. They often have cervical spinal stenosis too, so they get very complicated as they get older, and um, they're difficult to tease out neurologically. I'll talk a, a bit in a minute, I think, about how you tease out lumbar spinal stenosis type symptoms uh, from peripheral neuropathy. It can be very tough, and it can be very tough in our EMG lab to sort that out. Patients with wild type, again, they don't typically it would be unusual for a patient with wild type to develop orthostatic hypotension in my experience. So carpal tunnel and amyloid, as I mentioned earlier, it often predates other amyloid manifestations. And um, this is an awesome thing in neurology to have something predate the development of more significant neurological uh, issues like peripheral and autonomic neuropathies, but uh, typically, Carpal tunnel and amyloid is symmetric. It's usually bilateral. Of course
course, diagnosed by, by EMG. Patients with amyloid can also develop ulnar neuropathies as well. So with respect to lumbar spinal stenosis, so the, really the clue here clinically is patients will report sensory symptoms with lumbar spinal stenosis, but they'll be asymmetric. So that's your clue. So patients will say, yeah, I've got some back pain. It may be radicular. It may be present when they walk, uh, pain down into the legs. They'll often have sensory symptoms, but the sensory symptoms will be asymmetric. So it'll be, you know, mostly in one foot, or um, they'll have it in a foot and a leg and not much in the other side. And that would be unusual for a peripheral neuropathy. So that's some clinical clues to help sort out, um, aside from EMG testing, which should be helpful in distinguishing uh, peripheral neuropathy from lumbar spinal stenosis. But if somebody has amyloid and a significant peripheral neuropathy, it would be much more likely to be TTR than wild-type amyloid if, um, if their neuropathy is due to amyloid. With respect to peripheral neuropathy and amyloid, amyloid affects small fiber nerves first. So the small fiber nerves are the nerves that send in information regarding pain and temperature. The small fiber nerves are also autonomic nerves. So these are the first nerves to be affected in amyloid, and so that's why patients will have uh, oftentimes burning uh, neuropathic type pain. That's due to involvement of those small fiber nerves, which happens first. Um, so patients will otherwise uh, present with sensory symptoms, um, and then if, as the neuropathy progresses, uh, they can develop weakness and imbalance, and hopefully these days in the area of therapeutics, uh, uh, that's not gonna happen. This is tough when you have patients with both neuropathy, lumbar spinal stenosis, and amyloid sorting out what's due to what. I think this is one of the huge challenges uh, in, in amyloid patients. I mentioned earlier, you're, you're really looking for asymmetries, um, and, and you use your MRI and your EMG additionally as tools to help distinguish uh, what's what in these, uh, in these patients. With respect to autonomic neuropathy and amyloid, um, this can be tough to make, to differentiate uh, what's autonomic from, say, symptoms being used to treat cardiac issues um, and then just cardiac involvement in and of itself, but you're looking for symptoms of orthostatic intolerance, so these are symptoms that are present when upright that get better or resolve when you sit or lay down, so orthostatic intolerance, also history of syncope or near syncope. Um, the tricky thing also is many of these patients, particularly with transthyretin amyloid, they may have, autonom have had autonomic symptoms for so long um, that they may not actually recognize them until we do autonomic testing on the patients. And then we say, hey, did, did, you, did you know that you're, you dropped your blood pressure? And they say, oh, well, yeah, actually, I, I've been thinking about it. I do have more lightheadedness than, uh, than what I, I, I indicated when we first met. Enteric neuropathy, amyloid involvement of the gut is horrible. We shouldn't let it happen. It's impossible to treat. Um, and many of us who've cared for amyloid patients for a long time, particularly in the area, era prior to treatment, um, these patients haunt me um, because it's awful. The diarrhea is awful, and there's not a lot that you can do about it, so we should keep it from happening. Uh, patients can present with heat intolerance, so they basically lose the ability to sweat due to loss of those small fiber nerves. And um, so they'll, they'll complain of heat intolerance. Uh, the GI dysmotility, they may complain of nausea. They have early satiety. So you ask them, do you feel like you fill up more quickly than you ought to when you're eating a meal? And that would suggest that they may have an impairment in small or in uh, gastric emptying. They may have gastroparesis. Patients, though, may have... Uh, an enteric neuropathy that affects the lower GI tract, including the small intestine, which is under-recognized in patients with autonomic uh, neuropathy, and that can also mimic uh, gastroparesis, but also be associated with bloating and, di and diarrhea. So the importance of, of early treatment. Um, this was an interesting case. This 44-year-old female, she had a history, family history of uh, TTR amyloid. Her father had a liver transplant, died afterwards. And the patient came to us reporting paresthesias in her calves and feet. She had postural lightheadedness when standing still. And really her neurological examination was quite unremarkable. You had to do, you had to look pretty carefully to find any evidence on exam of a neuropathy. But she did have symptoms suggestive of a neuropathy 
in addition to the orthostatic intolerance suggesting um, autonomic involvement. So she probably saw Dr. Rosenthal. Um, she had uh, uh, testing. EMG was just barely abnormal. Her autonomic uh, testing, which I think I show in a second here, was abnormal. And uh, yes, as a neurologist, we sometimes do treat patients. And uh, so we initi initiated the patient on silencer uh, treatment. And what I wanted to, to demonstrate, well, I'll just first show the, the studies. The EMG was minimally abnormal. Um, cardiac testing, not all that um, or not all that remarkable. And then here's her autonomic testing. So um, she doesn't sweat well in the, in the foot. We put little capsules on the skin at four spots on the foot, distal leg, proximal leg, and forearm. Iontophoresis, acetylcholine, measure sweat output. And so the nerves going to the sweat gland in the distal in the foot uh, are impaired. That would be fairly typical of what we might see with an amyloid autonomic neuropathy. Um, and then she had uh, cardiovagal impairment as well, um, which, so reduced heart rate variability with deep breathing. We have patients breathe at six breaths per minute and measure heart rate variability that was reduced. And then um, she had a postural drop in blood pressure, as you can see here. Wasn't horrible, but significant. And this is after treatment, so we were able to actually demonstrate that in this case of a mild um, autonomic neuropathy, that we can actually improve um, the autonomic system. So you can see we, um, her sweating went from 0.06 to 0.23. So sweating to the, the foot improved. Heart rate variability still abnormal, but better than it was. And you can see blood pressures were significantly better um, she was actually fairly hypotensive at times. And uh, so this was early treatment. Uh, some people may not have treated this individual because the examination was not all that abnormal. The EMG was not all that abnormal, but she had significant autonomic involvement. Um, the autonomic testing was abnormal. And I would advocate strongly for early treatment Early treatment, even in the presence of, uh, of neurological, peripheral nerve, autonomic dysfunction, um, we may see improvement in these cases. In conclusion, uh, neurological complications, common, maybe early. They can be very heterogeneous. Um, they vary in severity. Multiple systems can be involved. Peripheral somatic nerves, peripheral autonomic nerves, enteric nervous system, carpal tunnel, preceding the neurological involvement. Neurological testing is, is very helpful, particularly autonomic testing. Shout out to autonomic testing. Um, and I would advocate strongly for early treatment. We shouldn't let patients get as far progressed as the first case that I presented. Thank you.